do the words that Chief Seattle spoke when he signed his peace treaty with the Army. And uh, it fits, I think, right into what we're about here, why we are, we're here for, for nature. And so I'd just like to read his words. How can you buy the sky? Chief Seattle began. How can you own the rain and the wind? My mother told me, every part of this earth is sacred to our people. Every pine needle, every sandy shore, every mist in the dark woods, every meadow and humming insect, all are holy in memory of our people. My father said to me, I know the sap that courses through the trees as I know the blood that flows in my veins. We are part of the earth and it is part of us. The perfumed flowers are our sisters. The bear, the bear, the deer, the great eagle, these are our brothers. The rocky crests, the meadows, the ponies, all belong to the same family. The voice of my ancestors told me, the shining water that moves in the streams and the rivers is not simply water, but the blood of your grandfather's grandfather. Each ghostly reflection in the clear waters of the lakes tells of memories of the life of our people. The water's murmur is the voice of your great-great-grandmother. The rivers are our brothers. They quench our thirst. They carry our canoes and feed our children. You must give to the rivers the kindness that you would give to any brother. The voice of my grandfather said to me, the air is precious. It shares its spirit with all the life it supports. The wind that gave me my first breath also received my last sigh. You must keep the land and air apart and sacred as a place where one can go to taste the wind that is sweetened by the meadow flowers. We love this earth as newborn, as a newborn loves his mother's heartbeat. If we sell you our land, care for it as we have cared for it. Hold it in the mind of the memory of the land as it was, as it is when you receive it. Preserve the land and the air and the rivers for your children's children and love it as we have loved it. Well, I think that really captures what many of us already know is that we have this deep sense of gratitude for the natural world around us and yet many in our society have lost that connection. And so we as, a, as an organization feel that we should um, help society <laughs> reconnect with, with the thing we, we depend on to actually live. And so, um, I'm going to invite Kai Bushke up here. He will be leading our workshop. He is the regional coordinator for Washington, Oregon, and now Hawaii. That's some people interested in this movie. He works both on community civil rights and natural rights of nature. And so um, we, he's given talks in the area already on the community rights facet of activism and looking for change to improve our way of looking at um, the world and the environment and our health. Um, but uh, this is a relatively uh, little known way to also implement change. Although um, I think so, there was something on the news yesterday about it. So it is starting to get to be better now. But without further ado, I'll try to take it over. Thanks. Apparently I have two gavels now. <laughs> um, so I thought we'd, we'd start with a, just maybe a, a quick go around. Um, I, don't, I know a number of you and a lot of people I don't know here. And you may not know one another. So I thought what we could do is just your name, where you're from. And then in addition to that, um, if you had a word or two about what you think or what you feel defines this region that you live in. What, what's Kind of that affinity or connection that you may have to where you're you're from so nothing too too lengthy but maybe a, a couple words about what that may be so just name where you're from and, and what do you think about where you live what defines it what sort of connection you might have to to this place so as always we need a, a volunteer where i can choose somebody so <laughs> you your first i'm phoenix luby i have lived in this area my entire life i will tell you how many years uh, I grew up with these words of Chief Seattle, 
and uh, it's something that was brought home to me very strongly. Ann James, I have lived in Newport for 20 years, and I like the, uh, the quiet and the peace and the clean water and clean air, and I want it to stay that way. <laughs> I agree with that. I'm Joyce. I've been here since 1977, and I want to continue to look at the mountains and the rivers and have them be part of my life and of the lives that come after me here. I'm Ellie, and we bought some property here, 26 acres, in 1994. And so we've been coming up here every year since then, and five years ago we moved up here. and. We just love the area. The people are our people. We came from a very populated area in Central Oregon to here, and we just love the beauty of it and want to keep it that way. I'm Ed Stiskel. I'm a wildlife biologist by training and uh, profession. And uh, I think what I like about this area, besides the the clean air, the clean water, the greenery, the wildlife, uh, the, the wildness of it. Uh, I like the culture here. The culture is kind of slow, uh, which maybe to the people that have lived in that all their lives, uh, maybe they can look for something faster, but believe me, when you come from a bigger city, it's heaven. I'm John Enders. I moved to Newport in uh, the summer of 2017, and I had been to Washington State in the 70s working in forestry, moved back to Wisconsin, but I knew we wanted to come back here, so moved here in 2017, and I'm here because I love the natural surroundings. And I'm Andrew Forster. I've lived here about four years. Like I like the quiet, and from the other side of the mountains, and I don't think I could ever go back there. I like the quiet, I like the peace, I love the people. That's why I'm here. I'm Althea Sundell, I live in Spirit Lake, Idaho, and it's impossible for me to separate out the strands of my life from the history of my life here since 1982 and the experience of the environment and the climate here. Um, Lorraine Sundown, I'm also from Spirit Lake. Um, I just say that water is the most important thing. I'm Heidi, I live over by Jewel Lake, and I've been here for five years. And um, I have a holistic retreat space, and so all the clean elements is really important to me, the air, the water, the land, uh, the animals. I'm really curious how this fits into protecting some of the animals, too, actually. Thank you for having me. I'm Elizabeth Eha. I'm from Sandpoint, Idaho. Uh, moved there, is going my third spring now here. And what brought us here was um, the fact that was the clean air and water and the quality of life, the community, the, the 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 slowness of it, I guess. It was, it was, there's a better word, I'm sure. but. Um, we had just had a kiddo and we're living in Southern California and there was no way that that was gonna be somewhere I could raise my kid. And so we started a four state search on where we were gonna you know, put down our roots and raise our child um, and this was it. And the community has been amazing um, and that's why I'm here to learn how I can keep it amazing and fight for it. Uh, Tracy Morgan. How I got here was rather random, but um, staying here was very deliberate. So um, a lot of you know I like maps, and when I was looking at the map, um, I realized that between here and the North Pole, there actually aren't that many people. <laughs> like almost no one, <laughs> if you drew a line. And I thought, well, that's where the wild things live. And I just liked being on the edge of that. Um, history and natural place and um, hope we can keep it as pristine as possible. Well, my name is Tony Bender and we've been lived here since 1975. 
75. <laughs> <laughs> we live in a cabin in the woods, and, and I love the, my freedom, my privacy, the quietness, everything. Yeah, uh, Mark Bender, um, 1975, uh, forester by training in civil culture and growing trees and doing that sort of stuff. Um, um, yeah, we both actually grew up in big cities, I think like a lot of folks, but uh, we came back to the land in the 60s and the 70s. But um, yeah, there's really a disconnect now you can see uh, from rural to urban and to keep to keep the rural I think is real important for the uh, sub uh, suburban or the the big cities because I think we as humans are losing that connect so we've got to stay we got to keep things kind of the way it is here just for open space. Phyllis Cardos is what Mark said, for sure. Um, I have a real concern because over the 10, 20, 30 years, we've lost a lot of forest land, agricultural land. Mm -hmm. We've lost a lot of open spaces. And I don't think people realize mm -hmm. how much we have lost. Mm -hmm. So I have, a, I have a real concern about that adva advancement of the urban mm -hmm. into the rural. Mm -hmm. and, and somewhere, it, there has to be a balance, but somewhere it has to stop. Mm -hmm. So we need more places like what we have here, not less. So. I'm Anita King, and I uh, was born and raised in Spokane, um, and camped at Marshall Lake and Bead Lake, and went to church camp when I was um, 10 at Davis Lake, and, and, and on and on, moved away. Some years ago, I made a conscious decision to move back here. 30 years ago, my parents were, were raised in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. I was born in Spirit Lake, Idaho. My mother in raised in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho in the 1920s. So I have that connection back here. And one of my favorite places to camp was Marshall Lake, so. I'm Jeremy Conlon from Coca-Cola. I'm Janet Conlon from Local and um, I do a lot of volunteer work with water quality in uh, the North Idaho area. I'm Gretchen Koenig. Um, my husband and I moved here from Ohio via Bellingham in 1973. And the reason we moved here is because we wanted to be in a place where there were, was a spirit that would take care of the land and the Kalispell tribe um, is that spirit and I wanted to be close to them and I wanted to be in an area that I knew would be preserved for you know people to connect with nature when they had lost their way because, like Mark said, people lose their way. When they get too wrapped up in technology and civilization. So I hope we can preserve the, you know, the wild areas. I specifically did research before I came here to find a, a county that had as much federal or state or open land as possible. And, you know, plus the tribe. That's. I'm King. I'm Pete LaPerry, Hoodoo Valley, 1983. Mother Earth First. Amen. <laughs> just have people uh, say who they are, where they live, and uh, just some words or two about why you like where you live. Or okay. Well, uh, we're James and Linda Sheeler. We live on Flowery Trail in Usk. And um, uh, we have a great big piece of property that we've really tried to um, 
like used for the good, but we tried to like help homeless people and stuff and give them a place to stay and a chance to work for their rent. And they've really used us, stolen from us, and trashed the place out. And um, I think there's not enough recycling in general. And I'm here to meet other people that hopefully care about the earth and could actually, you know, matter in my life. So. <laughs> um, so I wanted this to be less about me talking and more about people interacting because the, the term rights of nature is really multifaceted. There's a, a, a clear legal component. We'll talk about that reality both in the United States and internationally. Uh, but there's also clearly, in my mind, moral, ethical, cultural, spiritual elements as well to, to the concept. Um, and so I'm trying to build the workshop today to sort of touch on a lot of that, because I think it's all interrelated, uh, even though a lot of the focus will get down to what people have done to sort of articulate rights of nature within systems of law, uh, both in the United States and internationally. Uh, and that's largely my goal tonight is to, to lay that out um, for people to discover, have a conversation on, uh, for me to add in where I can. Uh, and then I think at the end, the idea was to talk about if this idea, as we go through it this evening, where to uh, be in existence and, and honored, even let's say within the legal context, in your region, what would that look like? Uh, and to have sort of a exploratory conversation about what that could be in the sense of, of where you live, whether it's Spirit Lake or Newport or Sandpoint or wherever, looking at this, this broader region, so not just specifically Ponderay right County. Um, so as a, as a means to start, and you should all have a packet in front of you, I hope, does someone not have one? And though it's late in the evening and you may be tired and mid evenings are getting to your feet, you're going to have to do some work immediately. <laughs> and your first job is uh, as you flip open that packet, there's a poorly copied story. And the first thing is for everyone just to take, it'll probably take five, seven minutes to read that story to yourself. And then I'm going to have you work in small groups, three people, and just sort of talk about your reactions to that story. Uh, this will be sort of a guide through the rest of this evening, and then we'll kind of come back together as a big group after that small group discussion and go from there. So. If you want to read it, I can too. Yeah. Oh, okay. I've got reading. And I also wanted to add that I would love to have a Green Party. Like, I used to be part of a Green Party uh, group in Illinois, and I haven't found anybody locally around here that cares about that politically. Anybody here? We'll, we'll talk. <laughs> Sometimes you yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, man thinks they're superior just be choice. We can choose our behaviors, you know, because all rattlesnakes act like rattlesnakes and all bears are going to act like bears. But humans are very varied and we can choose whether to work with what we got or, you know, try to control it all like people do. Chief Seattle. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Is concerned about 
The other, the other thing too was a statement here: the only thing left to eat is the truth, and that is rather a kind of a profound statement in today's world. Mm -hmm. The only thing left to eat is the truth. Yep. So. This compilation is really about the legalization aspect of it. Um, so I it, just take maybe two minutes and just kind of run through the list. You're not going to be able to read everything, but just kind of skim through the list, and then we'll just spend a couple minutes uh, talking about what stood out to you in the, in the list. Of it's this kind of global consciousness that we're starting to wake up to that, oh, we've not, we've been, um, we have an imbalance in, in rights of human, humanity versus nature, and even the Pope is um, uh, presenting that thinking to the UN, so I think it really is coming to be, coming. I would like to see us quit calling it ecosystems. Systems seem to be very, I don't know, breaking it down into every little part, the, the mechanistic concept. Let's go back to eco-communities. Mm -hmm. And also, human rights and the rights of eco-communities, again, we're separating. Right. Human rights, eco, come on. Yeah, we it's all the same beings. thing. <laughs> and we should be able to live with nature. <laughs> So you're pointing out one of the, the big questions right now, even from a legal perspective, how do, you, how do you define things? How do you talk about things? One of the arenas of which the lawyers work on as well, how do you actually represent nature in a way that you're actually representing nature and you're not imposing human-centric terms? So uh, there's been discussions about, in a legal perspective, how do, you, how do you, in some ways, stand in for nature? Uh, and one element that lawyers have debated is, you know, do you utilize things like the guardian ad litem model within the legal system, which is where adults can speak for children or people who can't speak for themselves? Uh, and so there's some people believe that that's a method within the current legal construct. Others say, well, it's not as if nature is incapacitated or unable to, to be. Uh, so what, how does language articulate that? So I think that's a very good point around what is, how are we going to talk about it? Uh, so that's also part of the evolving reality, I think, of this work at this moment, is figuring out the terminology, the right words to use. And it's ever changing. Things in our own past, moments in our own past, uh, where right space types movements have built. Why is that? Why, why did they emerge? Why did they build? What, what, what was the reason for it? I'll give you a hint. What if, think about the abolitionist movement, or the suffragist movement, or the civil rights movement. Some type of crisis. Some type of crisis. Caused by, by what, typically? Greed. Humans, greed, what else? Industry. Industry. Suffering. What other what other reasons might there have been a need to push for a different reality? The Bible. Yeah, sustainability. What about the law? Mm -hmm. True. Yeah. <laughs> Systems of law that justified certain actions that of course became untenable. Uh, for societies, for communities, and the move was then to change that. Uh, so seeing the ripple effect in different parts of the world it has come out of need. It has come out of an analysis of our current legal structure and how it associates and treats the environment. Um, our organization, the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund, started out in the realm of what we call conventional environmental law. Uh, that working within the confines of how U.S. environmental law operates, uh, we would, in essence, help communities to try to protect their community, try to protect the environment, based on using those legal tools. Uh, and what we had learned in the five or six years of doing that kind of legal work, there's basically two realms of which you operate within. The front-end realm is typically around the permit issuance process. 
so that there's a certain type of activity that's going to happen or is being considered, often the corporate uh, applicant looking to do something, so they have to go through a process in order to get their legal permit, so that what they do is legal. Uh, that's the whole goal of, of the permitting process, to permit something that they did without the permit would be illegal. So that is a big arena of a lot of environmental work, not just for the attorneys, but for activism itself. Uh, their activism is tied to that particular realm, uh, because that's the realm of which has been created, and so it's the realm of which naturally communities, individuals, and law firms uh, operate within, uh, as well as the corporate applicants, as well as the state agencies or the federal agencies involved. So in essence, the entire system works within that scheme of uh, statutes or federal acts or policies that come about uh, amongst the different jurisdictions. The other realm is, is really often the enforcement side. So something has been authorized and someone is now operating outside, outside the authorization that they were permitted. And of course what they were permitted to do was to pollute uh, or to in essence affect the environment to a certain degree or to a certain rate of speed. Uh, that the permit was about legalizing harm to the environment based on the rules that were created. Uh, so the other, or what we call the end of the pipe stuff, is to sort of hold those to account who may have exceeded the boundaries of what they were legally allowed to do. So those are, in large degree, where most of the environmental work goes into, whether it's the activism side or the legal side. Of course, there's some exceptions around Endangered Species Acts and other types of acts that are folded in there, but the lion's share really is around uh, permit application processes or the enforcement of the permits once they're issued. Um, our role in that as an organization was when we would get phone calls, not so dissimilar to me getting a phone call from people in this room about the situation around the smelter, is we have, we have something proposed for a community that we don't think fits in our community from all the different reasons that you can imagine uh, people have spoken about around the smelter, for instance. Uh, and the same goes whether you're looking at a factory farm or a toxic waste incinerator or a fracking operation or a mining operation or something that's going to have substantial impact that people are looking at it environmentally, they're looking at it socially, they're looking at it economically, they're looking at it culturally, they're looking at it from a, from a holistic viewpoint that X is really not something that's going to fit within our community. What can we do about it? Uh, and then what we can do about it uh, is then often this process of putting people inside a particular system of which then you get to be heard within the system uh, that often is created by those corporate interests that are trying to set up shop in your very community. So if you go upstream in the process, the regulations that regulate a particular industry will come often from a state agency which are often getting their orders from state legislation or federal legislation, not fairly parallel. Uh, and that legislation, whether it's a statute at the state level or some congressional act, uh, is often written by industry interests. So the factory farm industry or the GMO industry or the pesticide industry or the fossil fuel industry is often writing the very rules that are going to regulate their behavior. Uh, and then those rules are then given to the state agencies to implement, <clears throat> in which then the communities are given these entry points to participate in that process. Uh, so to file your comments, to appeal particular uh, issuances or particular decisions along the permitting process, to call into question omissions, deficiencies, anything sort of out of the ordinary within the process. So you become specialists on the process, or administrative uh, specialists. Uh, but what's left out of the equation is where's the community's decision-making power within that process to say whether we want this at all, let alone why should we participate in something that we don't even subscribe to. But the system is very good at forcing you into that arena because that's, those are the official rules. And as a law firm, that's what you work with because that's what you're given to operate within. Uh, and in that realm, as the lawyer representing the group or the individuals, whoever it is, you're looking at what the process lays out, and in essence, you're looking to see that everything is being met properly within the filing process of some type of a permit 
that will be issued for some type of a corporate activity. <clears throat> and so you do, in large degree, a lot of, I guess you could call, sort of proofreading, sort of comparing the regulations to the applications themselves to find something wrong with the application, <clears throat> which is what we did for five or six years. We did that kind of work, um, in essence, on behalf of the community, on behalf of nature, uh, to try to put the brakes on these projects that would have these kinds of impacts, again, environmentally and otherwise. And we were very good at that, not because we had some brilliant collection of attorneys, it was merely because, one, we showed up, which in large degree, what happens in a lot of cases, no one shows up. So the apartments move through the process and get their permits issued. And even when you do show up, it's merely about looking through to make sure that things match up. You know, did they submit what they needed to submit? Uh, is what they submitted current? Um, did they have the right person to even sign a particular bond related to something or another? So you're merely going through trying to find something wrong with the paperwork, basically. And often you can be successful, and we were very successful in doing that. But in a process like that, eventually, if those things are correctable, the permit will be issued because you run out of things to argue. Because there's no longer anything within the process of what you can do to stop the process itself. But even if you made it go back to a starting point or back further in the process or have to put more time in, it became a game of which you were hoping you were frustrating the applicant to the point where they didn't want to show up because our system of law basically leaves that as one of our only real options if you want to work within the system itself is can we frustrate them enough that they go somewhere else or that they give up I see a lot of people smiling and last thing <laughs> sounds familiar um, <clears throat> unfortunately in so many realms uh, the applicant doesn't go away and the applicant eventually gets their permit issued because they've met all the requirements again understanding that largely the process itself came from them in the first place or had a high degree of ability for the project to move forward because the legislation adopted was all about really bending towards the corporate activity as being the higher good within how things work and that the realities of the community or the realities of nature itself uh, are lesser or perhaps not even considered at all. So another thing to remember about our legal system today, and to put it in the context of today's topic of rights of nature, is nature is basically seen as property under our system of law. Nature has no rights. Okay? It's seen as a thing. Uh, it's lifeless. It's in some ways no different than the corporate form no different than physical property in the sense of building, it is property. In some ways, it's less than that. Uh, that that other kind of privileged property that I mentioned earlier really is something superior to that of nature itself. And so you can see in processes of permitting smelters or permitting factory farms or permitting fossil fuel extractions, why it's so difficult to really do the environmental protections, even with environmental laws being in place, if they're actually bent towards those activities being seen as a higher good within the system. So this is a world we worked in for five or six years and eventually stopped doing that, uh, even though we were very good at challenging permits, the on-the-ground reality was something very different. Because in a lot of those cases, the permits got issued and the corporate activity came into these communities because uh, they weren't able to frustrate them enough or make it politically untenable enough uh, but within the official process, they ran out of, ran out of options. Um, and it's out of that sort of realm of necessity and that realm of really injustice that rights of nature began to emerge. Uh, and it emerged out of a community called Tamaqua Borough. It's in your list of the rights of nature timeline. Who was dealing also with a corporate project who looked at the existing environmental laws as it stood with the state of Pennsylvania and how it was bent towards allowing activity that was really about destroying or degrading the environment and not actually protecting it. Uh, and they took the first step in 2006 to actually legalize rights of nature, which eventually led two years later to Ecuador putting it into their own constitution. So the idea of how do things move, how do movements build, how do they spread, uh, it's an example of, well, someone looking at something and saying, well, that's unjust, it's illegitimate, 
that's disconnected from what really, we really need is to disconnect it from the natural world, we actually have to propose something very different, very radical, very outside the box. And perhaps in doing so, maybe somebody else will do it. And in a large degree, the world that we work in now is really still built on that sort of ridiculous statement <laughs> that, well, if I do it, maybe somebody else will do it. Uh, and in a large degree, that's where things sit. We'll talk more about that, that later in a different context. So you have a legal system that doesn't see nature but as property. You have a legal system that wants to see nature really as a thing for use of humans and not as a, a living, breathing, sentient you know, community, um, to not use the word system, um, that should have the right to exist, persist, naturally evolve on its own, exclusive of human communities, for instance, and as well as connected to human communities. But that's not the system law we have today. And so you can see how people, just as people have recognized that African Americans were not property, that women were not property, that needed to change, the conversation needed to change. The discussions needed to change. The idea needed to get, to get out there. And in all those efforts to actually shift things that were seen under property as law to actually being rights-bearing, they ran into the same kind of things initially that people didn't conceive of it initially. Because why conceive of it if it's not seen in the same level as you are? You wouldn't even have that enter your brain. <laughs> but some people eventually started to put it out there. And of course, as one can imagine, there was resistance to the idea of, the, of women having rights, for instance. You know, what a ridiculous notion that women should have rights. That's not so long ago, but that's you dealt with that history, I'm sure there's some of you that have, that that's a very similar parallel to what the environment sits in today, whether it's the United States or elsewhere. Um, if you flip to your packet and go past that timeline, part of the reality of the world we lived in, one of my colleagues called that particular phase of our existence Groundhog Day. Has anyone seen the movie Groundhog Day? where you just wake up and it's the same day over and over again. That's kind of our existence for, for five or six years was we kept doing the same thing. It was like almost the same day with basically the same result coming out. Um, there's a, a better example in written form that was put together a number of years back now by a woman named Jane Ann Morris. So if you have your packet open to her up top, it says current environmental laws and activism. <clears throat> where she sort of lays out not just the legal reality, but sort of the cultural society and, and sort of the activist reality of what was happening back when she wrote this. But I think as we go through the bits and pieces that are here, you will we'll probably see parallels still in motion in existence today. Again, this is a number of years later. Um, so we're just going to, this is excerpts of a, about a three or four or five page uh, article that you can find online. Um, but I pulled out a few things here just for us to read and kind of hear the echoing of the words of Jane Ann Morris. Um, she also is considered a corporate anthropologist, <laughs> which is sort of a weird thing to put together, but looking at this idea that under our system of law, for instance, corporations are persons. So they've been ascribed constitutional rights the same as persons, same as people. Uh, and so it's not so far-fetched, I suppose, that you would need a corporate anthropologist um, to talk about that reality and how that works against us in trying to do the work we try to do it within our own communities. So um, do I have a couple, uh, maybe a first volunteer to do a little bit of reading to the group? Liz, if you want to read the, how about read the first two paragraphs there, the longer one and the short one. Sure. Our campaigns follow the gambling addiction model. The last bet didn't pay off, but the next one might. If, if, if we just had a new improved tripod, three more experts, more labor or church support, 10 more elected officials on our side, 100 more people at the demo, or a thousand more letters in the mail. Who are we kidding? We are just doing the same old thing over and over again and fooling ourselves that it might work next time. We are stuck in a feedback loop where our failures are interpreted as signs that we should repeat our failed tactics but try harder. This is what it is to be colonized. Mm -hmm. have another reader? And if you want to read, um, 
about one, two, three, four, five. The, how about the next six paragraphs? They're all pretty short. Many of our groups are organized to save wolves, butterflies, trees, prairie flowers, rivers, deserts, or estuaries. But corporation executives don't organize to destroy the wolves, butterflies, flowers, estuaries, nor do they organize to pollute the air, spoil the rivers, or promote five-legged frogs. This asymmetry should give us pause as we try to understand why corporations are on a roll while we're stuck in a feedback loop. Let's look again. Corporate strategy leverages their power. Their efforts reinforce and magnify each other. Our strategy splits our resources and dissipates our power. Corporate strategy aims to increase the power that corporations have over people. That means that when a single corporation gets a victory, it helps all other corporations too. They are all stronger, they all have more power, and the people have less. We work on separate harms. When we lock down to one old growth stand, others go unprotected. When we protest about one chemical, others go unprotested. When we testify to preserve one watershed, others are not spoken for. We have whole campaigns directed at <coughs> one chemical, one corporation, one species, one grove of trees, one article of clothing. All right, stop that. Any reactions so far? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, another reader? John, why don't you read that next, um, up to where, read all the way to where it says this is being colonized. We have a strange, but it's the law syndrome. Why can't we bring up important issues at EPA hearings? It's regulatory administrative law. Why can't we get our views accurately presented on TV? It's corporate, private property law and FCC regulations. Why can't we imprison corporate executives for what the corporations do? It's liability law. So what do we do? We tow the line at the EPA hearing. We dress up as animals to get a moment on TV. We let lying corporate executives lie. That is, we work around the defining laws that are the groundwork for a rigged system. We're looking for favors, lucky breaks. We don't even dream of control, yet we call this a democracy. This is being colonized. And then the last two paragraphs. Anybody else want to read? What regulatory law regulates is citizen input, not corporate behavior. So when we cooperate in regulatory law proceedings, we are following the script that corporation representatives wrote for us. We're either colonized or we're collaborating. <coughs> that the regulatory agencies fail to protect the public is clear. Why they fail is another matter. Um, Janet Morris said to one of my colleagues that she said all that environmental laws regulate are environmentalists. Because <laughs> <laughs> they make us predictable. Um, which is, no. again, not uh, an attack on any individual in the sense of why they do it, but if you have a system that forces you into a, a sort of a predetermined destiny in large degree from a legal perspective, you know, doesn't it sort of, uh, you know, echo was people always attributed to Einstein, you know, to his definition of insanity, that we just keep doing the things over and over again expecting a different result because I'm sure no one could argue that, cumulatively speaking, where we sit today, it's not a very pretty sight out there, even though perhaps this region of the world or the country is in still in pretty good shape. Collectively, where we sit, you know, pretty much in hanging on by a thread, um, uh, largely because we continue to, I would say, be disconnected from the natural world. 
and we keep authorizing either the extraction, the pollution, uh, or the destruction of it for the sake of feeding what another colleague of mine used to call the endless production of more machines, so that we have this mentality that there's endless production of more needs to happen. And if that's the system you have, and that's the system you subscribe to, uh, and that's the system you believe in, well, that system is working quite well. Um, for others that don't see that or see what's really coming of that, then the question is, can we actually have true sustainability within that kind of system? Uh, or other types of questions. I think what's started to come out through rights of nature as one means is people saying, well, no, something new has to emerge. And so the idea of people pushing boundaries for new things to emerge, uh, just as a way that other rights movements have had to sort of push new ground boundaries that seemed, seemed inconceivable at the time they were originally introduced, uh, we're in that same place. The question is, two, how long is it going to take, and will it happen fast enough? Of course, we're dealing with something vastly different than uh, human civil rights. We're dealing with uh, the, the, the plight of the planet in the sense, at least of human populations related to that. So I think there's some, some, big, some big pressures out there. Um, if you look past that, that Jane Ann Morris piece, and I encourage you to read more of that. And one more thing to say about that process, we were, at the time when we were doing that work, we were under the impression that we were costing the corporation money. A lot of people said, well, at least we're costing them money and we're making it untenable for them. Well, anytime you drag them into court, they have to hire the attorneys that they have to hire. Uh, the attorneys that they hire are quite happy because that means they continue to build corporate interests and make more money. Um, plus, for the corporation, um, hiring those attorneys is a necessary business expense that they can write off. So, talk about other layers of how the system favors the economic actor of that and the community. Um, the next piece you have in here are just two short pieces from a woman named Mary Wood. Is anyone familiar with Mary Wood? Phyllis, did you have a question? I did have a question because the point you're bringing up, the point you're bringing up right now, I mean, we would, it's been almost two years now we've been fighting this smelter. I mean, really, with absolutely everything that we have. But what keeps going through my mind is, and you had said it a year and a half ago to our group, Maybe we can stop this one, but how about the next one and the next one? And that's what's frustrating me right now is thinking, do you mean I got to do this another two years with another mill coming in or with another heavy industry? You know, that's. Yeah, I think that's part I of mean, And that's literally just, just beating our wheels and going around the, the whole Groundhog Day syndrome, really, is what it is. I was working in the community of Tacoma on the west side, and they were on the docket as the first stop for a Chinese corporation to build, at that point, the concept was the world's largest methanol plant. Mm -hmm. uh, methanol uses natural gas, uh, of course, which comes largely from the fracking operations happening other places, um, in order as a material to make plastics, uh, which of course end up having all kinds of other effects environmentally. Uh, but also uses a tremendous amount of water. Um, so the operation that they were looking to put in Tacoma was looking to use 15 million gallons of water a day. That was going to be what they were aiming for based on whatever level of production over here. So people, as one would hear that figure, and especially in relation to that all water users in Tacoma industry and people together was less than that amount. So you would have a single user exceeding what the collective was already using within that municipal jurisdiction. Um, and so they quickly mobilized. Um, again, it was a situation where their, I guess their, their, their political coming together um, had the corporate in interest, the corporate applicant, decide not to move through the process, though legally speaking it probably had everything it needed to move through the process and then just decided in that instance to move down the road. So in Kalama, Washington now, that process is much further along for that basically same facility just to be moved down the I-5 corridor to a different location. And in essence, have the, in essence, very much the same effect, regionally speaking, as it would have if it was cited in Kalama. As that had finished up, a LNG terminal was back online, so that became the next thing. 
And that was already much further along in the process, and it's, it's fairly close to being a done deal, but to your point, all right, we fought this off, the next thing you know, we're having to deal with this thing. So that's part of, I guess, the efficiency of the system is to be able to, to, to do that. And on the community effect is, you know, what sort of energy resources, um, just energy level is there to continue to do the next thing, and why should we be the ones that have to carry the burden of proof? What would it look like if it was turned? Um, and so yeah, those are big sort of organizing activism questions. Um, the next thing I put in your packet, and there's two things there, but the one thing I'm just going to point out, um, the name Mary Wood, does that ring a bell to anybody? Um, she uh, is an attorney. She's a law professor at the University of Oregon. Um, she's been, in her own way, I guess, pioneering the uh, attempt to use this idea of public trust, or really the commons, and apply that to the climate. So a lot of public trust-oriented legal cases in our country, at least, have largely been applied to, to water issues or water-based industry related to sort of bodies of water. And so she's making the argument that it can be used for, for climate protection or climate change related uh, work. And her work has been picked up by a group called Our Children's Trust out of Eugene, who's now in federal court trying to argue on behalf of kids uh, and their own future, climactically speaking. Um, but if you read her work, she has a very similar analysis to the current environmental system as we do in the sense of what it actually does. So I have here the description of environmental laws. This is a short excerpt from a talk she gave, I guess, in Boulder in 2017, where she says, let me be clear, the problem is not any lack of written law. We have plenty of laws, regulations, agencies implementing the laws. The problem is that our laws have permitted the very destruction they were designed to prevent. Uh, they had been geared toward permitting pollution. So in essence, they had um, uh, authorizations. Technically speaking, the permit is property. So back to this idea of property. That permit is a piece of property that could be bought and sold. So if someone has a permit, they feasibly can have someone else pick up that same permit because it's a piece of property. And that these, these permits, these pieces of property documents, are really about the authorization to destroy the environment saying it's okay if you let so much air pollution or so much water pollution or this pollution or that pollution. That's largely what the environmental laws of the United States and other places in the world do today. Mm -hmm. Beneath that, you have um, what's listed there as Oliver Houck, uh, Noah's Second Voyage, The Rights of Nature as Law. The reason I put this in there is sort of this hybrid sort of moment going on, where you have Oliver Houck, he's an attorney, he's also a professor at Tulane, University in New Orleans. Also happens to be the architect of the Clean Water Act. So one of the seminal federal laws that came out in the 70s uh, that was to protect our waterways. I think the statistic today is still something like 50 plus percent of waterways are yet to meet the standards of which they were originally laid out back in under the Clean Water Act in the 70s. Uh, but he's become an advocate now, this idea of transforming legal systems to recognize nature's rights. And so he talks about it in this law review article, if you want to read it, that's the title of it, or you can believe, should be able to find that online. Oh, mm -hmm. One of the things I wanted to point out, and I think someone mentioned this earlier, is really that last line, where he writes here, by and large, humans do not like to change, nor do they like limits, nor do they like to fall from grace. And so think about the, the bears with lawyers story, and their whole comment about you know, just being offended that they were even in court, being offended that somehow they're being invested, you know, offended to the point where they just passed a new law in the middle of the night uh, in order to eradicate those that were questioning their position. And so I think that matches up quite well to Oliver Haug's statement here about what we're up against if people are going to push this new, nation, new notion, this new paradigm of law in regards to nature, what they're going to be up against despite where things have moved in a relatively short period of time. So in our timeline of really taking um, this legalization concept, we're going to get into where that comes from, uh, and putting it into motion, which was 2006 in Tamapa, rural Pennsylvania, and making its way to South America, to Ecuador, and eventually making it into about three dozen communities in the United States now. Uh, as well as showing up now in high court decisions in places like India and Colombia, 
uh, ending up in governmental decisions in places like New Zealand, looking at river systems, carrying this concept of personhood. So remember, corporations are person. They have personhood. Uh, ships are considered persons under the law. Um, so we've, we've, in our own Western legal law system, have recognized inanimate objects as persons. Uh, and this idea of nature gaining that same sort of ground or having bundles of rights uh, is also beginning to show up in other places. Um, but it's a fairly short period of time, especially in movement building timelines. So if you look at abolition or suffrage, you know, abolition 60 some years from the organized abolition. Of course, slavery votes were happening for hundreds of years prior to that. But as far as organized abolition or the suffragist movement, you know, 100 years, and some people say it still hasn't ended. The Equal Rights Amendment still not being ratified. Um, but you can see how long it takes to move things, that this is really culture work that has a legal component, but it's really culture work. And I think Howick is right in pointing out how difficult it is when the dominant proponents of the dominant benefactors of the system are forced to sort of have to view things differently, why that is so difficult, but that's a large degree what is currently happening on the rights of nature today. So if you flip open or flip to the next page where it says evolution of the legalization of rights of nature. Part of what we try to do when we do these classes, yes. Is this a good time for a break? Yeah, if you want to be like a five-minute break, you get up and stretch. We kind of promised them a little. Yeah, so um, my use of it comes from uh, a guy named Christopher Stone, who wrote a book in the early 70s about should trees have standing. And for those who like to read law review articles or read that aspect of history, um, you could read the book. There's also uh, a short article by that name online that you can find. And his, his view of this idea of nature and rights and the legal system um, made a debut in the Supreme Court. So there was a case uh, that went in front of the Supreme Court. I think it was called Morton versus Sierra Club. And it was a case of which, in the dissent, often will, if you dig again, also into the law review articles, especially around corporate rights and things of that nature, it's really the dissents that are sometimes far more interesting than the, uh, the, the affirmative uh, opinions written. But in that dissent, written by uh, actually Washington State Supreme Court Justice William O. Douglas, um, he wrote about this idea in that dissent. And he, that idea had come from Christopher Stone um, as he explored this idea of, of what it would look like and why moving that direction was necessary when it came to protecting the, the environment. So just as a means here tonight, and I always forget that when I do these things that uh, regardless of how we seem to put these things together, in some ways, no matter how much time we have, that a lot of what comes out is sort of like trying to drink from a fire hose. So um, <laughs> I apologize yeah. for that. In some ways, it's the nature of where we're at and trying to get as much information out as, as possible. So there's just a couple of things from what I printed off here that I wanted to, to highlight. And it's the, the first paragraph under that heading of Christopher Stone, Should Trees Have Standing? I'm going to read that, and then we can just talk briefly about what you hear there. He said, in Descent of Man, Darwin observes that the history of man's moral development has been continual extension in the objects of his social instincts and sympathies. Originally, each man had regard only for himself and for those of a very narrow circle about him. Later, he came to regard more and more, not only the welfare, but the happiness of all his fellow men. Then, his sympathies became more tender and widely diffused, extending to men of all races. Um, language is interesting. Uh, to the imbecile, maimed, and other useless members of society, and finally to the lower animals. And this is a, a quote I think he pulled from someone else. It's not Stone's words. And sorry for the poor copying there. You can all make the footnote references. Um, and then he says, the history of law suggests a parallel development. So this, this idea that, again, law changes, that law often only changes when the ideas start to move out there, moral questions and discussions begin to happen, there begins to be sort of this cultural momentum that builds and eventually builds into political power. Um, that's the only way that 
systems, at least in our existence, have have changed in that realm from the right list to the to the rights bearing. If you skip that big uh, center paragraph and go down, he starts to get into sort of that question of the unthinkable. He says, it's the note of the unthinkable that I want to dwell upon for a moment. Throughout legal history, each successive extension of rights to some new entity has been therefore a bit unthinkable. We're inclined to suppose the rightlessness of the rightless things to be a decree of nature, not a legal convention acting in support of some status quo. So think about that for a second. How does, I'll read that one more time. We're inclined to suppose the rightlessness of rightless things to be decree of nature, not a legal convention acting in support of some status quo. Like when you think about the word rights, what comes to mind when you hear the word rights? Allowances. What was that? Something is allowed. Allowances. Allowances. Equality. Equality. There's a, a long list in the U.S. Constitution in Bill of Rights. Bill of Rights. And I also think of the right to own property. Right to own property. What other rights? about rights. And there's things like people refer to as natural rights or natural law, uh, fundamental rights, inalienable rights, constitutional rights. What are the rights that normally get debated in court? Civil rights. Civil rights. Civil rights. Some type of constitutional rights. Within our constitution, there's enumerated rights, so the Bill of Rights are considered enumerated. There's also been rights that are called unenumerated rights. So through arguing that when the Constitution was um, ratified, that it, it, even though it laid out within the Bill of Rights, which of course was fought by the Anti-Federalists to insert in, it wasn't part of the original document. Uh, but this idea that if there were other rights that the courts were supposed to look at, in essence, there are other rights that existed beyond the Bill of Rights, the original 10 Bill of Rights. Um, that, that the Constitution could recognize that. And so the right to privacy, for instance, is a constitutional right. That was argued. It's not in the Constitution. It's not part of the Bill of Rights. But it's an unenumerated right. So I think what, what Stone is saying here is we often think that, right, that there's only a certain amount of rights out there, and if we haven't spoken to them yet, then they must not exist. Versus the really the legal reality is we've built them in. <laughs> either explicitly through something like the Bill of Rights or the original 10 bill, you know, amendments to the Constitution, or through things like unenumerated rights. You know, those have come through judicial decisions that there have been other rights that weren't really written down but are seen as fundamental constitutional rights. I think this is what, what Stone is putting out there is the possibility of, of other rights coming into being. Um, he goes on to say, it is thus that we defer considering the choices involved in all their moral, social, and economic dimensions. And so the United States Supreme Court could straight basically tell us in Dred Scott that blacks had been denied the right of citizenship as a subordinate and inferior class of beings who had been subjugated by their dominant race. So think about that in, in the tra trajectory of our own history, of course, at the time uh, African Americans were property under the wall. It was a time when uh, when a slave was murdered, it wasn't murder, it was a it was a property crime. You destroyed someone's property. That's how the, the legal system looked at it. Of course, people started to argue, and people have been arguing, that there was something morally and ethically unjust about the system of law that viewed other human beings that way. But it took time eventually for the legal system to recognize that. So his point is, you have cases in which recognize that, and then not so long, well, quite a while after that, but in some schemes, not so long after that, it, it shifted because it went from being rightless to rights bearing. And then Stone is pointing out what if nature is on that same sort of course. And then skipping the next two paragraphs, and sort of back to this, this idea of of normalization or familiarity to the idea and what it takes in the sense of those who have rights versus those who don't and what does it take for larger systems to get to that point to recognize rights. He says the fact is that each time there's a movement to confer rights onto some new entity, the proposal is bound to sound odd or frightening or laughable. 
This is partly because until the rightless thing receives its rights, we cannot see it as anything but a thing for the use of us, those who are holding rights at the time. And then in kind of in the same way, in the next paragraph, he says, there's something of the seamless web involved. There will be resistance to giving the thing rights until it can be seen and valued for itself. It is hard to see it and value it for itself until we can bring ourselves to give it rights, which is almost inevitably going to sound inconceivable to a large group of people. So back to what Hauk was saying about humans' inability to want to change and the difficulty with that. And then think about it in the sense of how human systems and the economic system and the greatest economic powers have oriented itself to the natural world. And now this notion that's coming out of, in a lot of cases, small rural communities or other uh, places on the globe or even other courts, this idea that perhaps a different legal system is needed in the sense of viewing the natural world as being rights-bearing. Uh, and how that comes into conflict with what the dominant system sees. And I would say today the dominant system, not just legally, but culturally, politically, economically, all of that is, is not one which wants to see nature as having rights, but still wants to see nature as, 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 as property. And at best what we're doing is protecting that property, very rarely for its own sake, but mainly for the conservation and efficiency of us using that property in some way, shape, or form. Just exist for my use or pleasure is a huge piece that has to happen in order for the laws to be upheld. And so again, we have a dangerous thing happening, I think, too, in our culture where people don't think that the laws matter. Does your group oppose humans owning land as a private property? No. <clears throat> and the word private means within the law as it's structured, they can do with, with that land as they feel they can do. Yeah, I, mean, I think the question is probably back to what Tracy was saying, saying does private action have public impact? I think that's and the reality is the public or private action to public impact is not largely coming from individuals, it's coming from corporate entities and government itself. So they're the largest property owners and they've had the largest impact on, on other rights. So in essence, property ownership or, or property has exceeded that of rights, not only of nature itself, but also people's rights to have clean air and clean water, for instance. And so there's the question of when those things come into conflict, you know, what, what should prevail? And that's part of what the legal system hasn't figured out. So in the rights of nature realm, being as new as it is, the only place that has had any um, sort of substantial cases around rights of nature has been Ecuador, because it's the only country that has it constitutionalized. So they had cases come up where a river system, where there was a road project, for instance, and that road project was affecting, there was fill coming into the river that actually affected the flow of the river. And people brought action on behalf of the river saying, well, this project is affecting the natural movement of that river, and therefore those who've affected that natural movement of the river should be liable to actually putting the river back into its original place before that project started. So I think in the rights of nature realm, you're also at a place where if you have systems recognizing that, you're also going to have times of which you're going to have to figure out how does the courts, how do the courts make those decisions when they come in conflict, just like other rights have had to go through the court systems to figure out how they would play against one another. Which I think also part of it comes down to what language you're going to use, how is it going to be conceived, what does it look like if it's implemented, what do the legal arguments look like if it is implemented? So as an example, in Toledo, they passed the Lake Erie Bill of Rights, recognizing that ecosystems' rights to exist and persist and naturally evolve. And then the question came is, all right, if there's things that are actually affecting that ecosystem, how do you actually deliver a legal case that acknowledges that rights have been violated? Because like in any legal case, you have to show evidence. You have to show cause and effect. And so there's, it's all a brand new territory within the legal system of how you're going to do that. But the question also again will have to come in about how do private property rights come up against the rights of nature, for instance. 
Uh, and some of that is unknown at this point if you don't have a legal system that's really operating there yet. So I think that's where the testing grounds have started to happen in other countries, uh, as well as a little bit here in the United States, to see how that's going to transpire. One of my concerns on that student is in this western part of the United States, and you may be aware of this, there has been off and on a Y2Y initiative. You know that? Y2Y? Yukon to Yellowstone. Mm -hmm. So I'm surprised you don't know it. Um, which would take away, which would make all this vast tract of land roughly 500 miles wide all the way down to Yellowstone, back to pristine forests and whatever, and remove all traces of human habitation. And since we're here, I don't want to be there. <laughs> one one thing, are you one sure thing that's that, the, I don't know, yes. One thing that this. strikes me and in the era in which we're living, um, <clears throat> how do we grant trees standing when we're willing to kill babies who have already been born? That's it's nuts. Absolutely not true. Oh, oh it is oh, true. No. Uh, there's partial partial birth okay. abortions where they yeah. suck the baby's yeah, so right yeah. out while it's still alive. Let's it but topic. let's keep it on topic. But you're right. Thank you. In your particular issue, I think you're pointing out the, the question of, of how societies are going to how do you formulate know? themselves. Yeah. How do you say this is more sure. precious to say than so this? To take your example and, and put a different entity in there, people would say, well, if corporations can have rights, a piece of property, why shouldn't nature have rights? So to take your, your metaphor and put a different component in there, I think those all become part of questions that people have to have conversations about, probably debates about, conflict about, which is no different than how other rights movements have built, uh, whether it was about women's rights, because your example I would guarantee you is about as vitriolic around women having rights as your example of the abortion issue at the time when people were considering that. It was inconceivable to that idea that women should carry their own rights separate from their husband or their father. So those are all then, the, you're bringing up the question of how do societies, how do culture, how does law all interact within that? And what does it want to subscribe to? That's part of what's unknown within the rights of nature at this point. Um, some people have looked at the system saying the way that it operates today is, is actually one not working from a practical standpoint. And then the idea is if you were to move something else forward that actually did what we thought the existing system would do, what would it look like? And what people are putting forward is the idea that, this, that ecosystems, natural communities, need to be rights-bearing. Because without that, they're lower on the sort of um, protected level, and we need to move them up. So that's the debate happening within the legal, cultural, political realm. Where you get at the very point of how does this stuff move, and how is it going to be accepted or rejected? And I think that's, that's where I mentioned earlier that this is about movement building, that if it's going to evolve to actually have any regency at some point, it has to go into that movement sort of idea, and I think that's what's unknown yet of whether or not it's going to build in that realm. But that's part of the tension, to figure out what does it look like, and how does it work, what's the practical implications, what are the potential consequences. And so these are the things that are just being discovered now as people have started to sort of put that idea out there. And so we're going to look at a couple of, of recent examples, because it's not just conceptual, it's, it's, it's happening, uh, both in the United States and elsewhere, and so the question is, what does that mean? And, and ultimately, part of the, the goal here tonight is what, what would it, if it means anything at all, to this region? And I think that was part of also the debate to, to, to figure out that, yeah, Colombia is nice and Ecuador is nice, but you guys don't live in Colombia or in Ecuador or Toledo or Lincoln County, Oregon, you live here. So the question is, what would it look like if, if you had that kind of a system here or not? And the questions that would come up, I guess, would be similar to the ones that you brought up just now. And there would be ones on the other side. And so I think that's part of, of tonight is really just to lay it out and not really to, to argue any particular 
point like this is going to happen, but more so it is happening, this is why it's happening, and just to sort of kick around ideas of what it will look like around this region. Um, what I want to say about the forest is, is to leave it completely alone and untouched by man is not the right answer. Because we are indigenous beings, we are meant to work with the earth. If we, we actually have way less forest fires when the little man is allowed to go in and clean out the dead wood. And then when there is forest fires, it's easier for the firemen to get around because they're not tripping over all this dead wood. And leaving all that dead wood just totally increases the bugs that are killing the wood. And so to leave the forest completely untouched is just as, it's like the difference between abuse and neglect. It's like a, a parent can lose their child for flat out abusing them or just flat out ignoring them. And we're losing custody of our forest by flat out abusing it and flat out ignoring it, and then it gets destroyed by fire. So I think that might be good at the end when we talk about this idea of potentially the concept of rights in nature in this region, for instance, and what does that look like? And I think that, that aspect can be brought up in those discussions. Okay. So I want to move us into looking at what I'm going to call case studies. So beneath the Christopher Stone stuff, if you flip through the pages, the first one is Colorado River. The next one is abbreviated LIBOR, which stands for the Lake Erie Bill of Rights. Flip over to the next, you have Columbia High Courts. Oh, excuse me, one below the Colorado River was Wild Rice. So um, they're really just excerpts, and I'll explain each as a little bit of background. And then what we'll do is we'll use those same groups of three each that we had earlier, or I think some people left, so you might have to read formulate yourselves, and you're going to pick one of those to talk about, and then we'll come back and have you basically teach the rest of the group what you discussed or what you learned about the information that you have in front of you. So the first one, the Colorado River, the background there is in 2017, a group brought um, a lawsuit on behalf of the Colorado River, uh, that action was being taken by government had violated the rights of the river, that they had decimated that ecosystem uh, to such a degree that they believe that the courts needed to take remedy on behalf of the river's rights. And so, in essence, it was a lawsuit that was filed uh, against uh, the state of Colorado. And so there's a couple just short pieces there related to that. <clears throat> and then coming out of that filing, there was an uh, article in the New York Times titled, Corporations Have Rights, Why Shouldn't Rivers? So this idea of when people talk about rights of nature, other entities having rights, and sort of this kind of more open debate about this, this concept. The next one called Wild Rice uh, is about a recent law adopted by the Ojibwe tribe. Um, this is about protecting the wild rice that they not only have an economic connection to, but a spiritual connection to, uh, and also the reality that there's a, a physical threat happening within their environment with a pipeline project coming. Mm -hmm coming through, and so there was an uh, urgency, in essence, to, to transform their tribal law, uh, in this case, to recognize a particular species and what that species was connected to. Uh, LIBOR, which stands against the Lake Erie Bill of Rights, that just happened at the end of February. The city of Toledo voted on adopting the rights of Lake Erie into their local charters, their local constitution, basically, of, of their government. And so there's a couple of headlines from that, and then a quote from um, a, a political science professor um, speaking to what just transpired. And just so you know that the fourth case study has the most to read through, so for those that don't want to read, <laughs> the next one. I read by through in two decisions from the high courts in Colombia. So two different cases, one in 2016 and one in 2018. The high court of, of Colombia recognized the rights of the Trotto River, so river ecosystem, and in a more recent case, the rights of the Amazon forest itself. And so I took excerpts out of a translation, uh, obviously in Spanish, but this is an English translation, of what the courts were saying about this idea of, of rights of nature, what that means within how we connect to the environment, and ultimately even there were mandates handed down to the government itself to take action uh, in, in, a, in a prescribed amount of time, that what you've been doing not only is not working, but it's contributing to the destruction of those ecosystems. And now the court is, author, is mandating that you actually take action to rectify that. So some pretty significant court decisions coming down around those two particular ecosystems in that country. 
So Colorado River, wild rice, like here, bill of rights, and then decisions coming out of high courts in Columbia. If you want to work again in, in groups of three and pick whatever one you want to pick, you spend about you know five, seven minutes going through it in some more detail and having some discussion about it, and then we'll have a, the reality in the sense of if people are interested, there's still skepticism, and in the legal sense, in some ways, rightfully so, because we have a system that's not built to recognize that. And then there's going to be the reaction of uh, people wanting to paint it as absurd and crazy. So back to what Stone was saying, well, it's, it's difficult for someone to see rights within the rightless thing. That's a natural sort of stage. One that's interesting to point out in the contrast of the two is the Colorado River lawsuit, of course, came in as just a lawsuit. So keep in mind, there was no law of which they were sort of basing it on. It was purely trying to make a constitutional argument. So in some ways, that unenumerated right type argument around rights of nature. Like Erie, it was about adopting a law. But two years later, the reaction was quite different than from the Colorado River lawsuit. So in two years' time, the overwhelming media that came out had a much more favorable tilt towards the idea of what the people in Toledo did. And not just in the United States, but internationally. So it's very interesting if you back up from just a uh, uh, climatizing sort of manner, how quickly in some ways things turn the corner about people chewing on this idea of rights of nature within a two year span of time, from the Colorado River lawsuit to the adoption of the Lake Erie Bill of Rights. Where it goes from here, who knows, but just in that comparison, it was quite interesting if you delve into it deeper. Um, John, what did your guys? So we did the uh, wild rice. Okay. And um, so the, the Ojibwe uh, have been fighting a, um, a pipeline uh, through their wild rice, and they are, uh, it says here that it, it appears to be the first time in the United States that a plant species has been granted legal personhood. And I don't know if that, has that actually happened? That it has been granted? I, I'm not sure if that's exactly. The so they, they drafted a law within their tribal constitution. It's adopted a system of law that is, um, speaks to human use, but also to the reality of that plant species having rights in the sense of what it's connected to. It's beyond just the individual plant, of course, but the right. ecosystem of, right. of plants there. But yeah, it's the first time that any jurisdiction, in this case, a tribal government. So it's, yeah, it's a tribal government. Yeah. So, but anyway, it sets an interesting precedent, I think, because, it, and there's a cultural connection there, too, with the way of life. So people need that to survive, or it's very important to their survival. Okay. And that's, to me, it just seems like it could be a, a good approach to establish cultural and way of life connections to some of the natural resources. Okay. Would I suppose be localized here, what we've been talking about here tonight, also full understanding that what's been talked about here may be brand new to a lot of you, uh, maybe something you have to chew on, but there's no obligation to come up with any uh, solutions. It's just sort of an open, open-ended kind of thing. Um, then in my view, much more time needs to be uh, given to what you just said in the sense of if systems are operating unjustly and they're needing to be changed, well, how do you go about doing it, especially larger systems? And the reality to that is you have to build movements. That's the only way that that thing happens. How you build it, what it looks like, is all going to be self-determined at some point. But I put in um, two pages out of a book called The Populist Moment. Does anyone know anything about the populists? So it's sort of the forgotten movement of our time of sorts with really the agrarian revolution in this country. So a lot of small farmers uh, from all over the country uh, were looking at how the economics were working with farming and how the, the larger interests, the uh, railroads and such, were basically holding them hostage. Uh, this is how uh, uh, cooperatives started to be formed. So they started to try to build uh, economic power amongst the small farmers so that they have better bargaining power. 
you know, the Grange movement, all that stuff came out of that era. Uh, they built a pretty substantial uh, beginnings of what you could call a people's movement at that time. Uh, they had, I mean, hundreds of thousands of lecturers going out <laughs> to speak. I mean, it was a phenomenal, uh, what one would call in Goodwin's terms, was the author of this book, a real democratic movement. So he talks about this uh, in his book. If you want to read his stuff at all and don't want to read the full book, you can find his introduction online that's worth reading if you want to read about this idea of movements. The only thing I want to talk about is on that second page where it's listed movement stages. You can spend more time reading that. Where he talks about how movements actually build. And I bring this up because I think it's very much related to if people are going to build the notion of rights of nature into something operational on a structural level, it's going to take a movement to do so. So in Goodwin's analysis, uh, movements have four stages. And the first stage is what he calls the creation of an autonomous institution where new interpretations can materialize that run counter to those prevailing, those of prevailing authority. The development which for the sake of simplicity may be described as the movement forming. So you have a different, a different take on how systems could look. And so it's the movement forming. His next stage is the creation of a tactical means to attract masses of people, the movement recruiting, so actually bringing more people in. The third he calls the achievement of a heretofore culturally unsanctioned level of social analysis, the movement educating, but this this broader analysis of what needs to be done and where we're headed towards, whatever it may be. We're not, it's not just rights of nature, but anything that may need to move in that way and his view is how it builds. And the fourth is really the creation of institutional means whereby the new ideas shared now by the rank and file, the mass movement, can be expressed in an autonomous political way the movement politicized. So eventually all movements get to that point where there's enough political power to actually move through and actually change things structurally. So if you start to analyze any sort of people's movements in the United States, that's all how they all have really built in that manner of, of being successful to change the actual structure of things. And then my last thing is in the idea of how you get there, the, really the first stage is the individual. That if you don't think it's possible, you're not going to get involved. So that self-doubt, we call the black hole self-doubt, <laughs> needs to be overcome. And once that's overcome, then there's possibility. And then with possibility, you build probability. And so in the example of Lake Erie, the two people that were principal in moving that had no idea what results their effort would have, but it's had massive ripple effects around the globe, basically. And so my part to finish, and then we can just open it up to discussion, uh, it really comes from one of the principal people. So on that last page underneath the movement stages, um, you have a quote here from Marky Miller from the Toledo group, um, where she said, obedience in the face of blatant injustice is offensive. Of obedience in the face of our own extinction is simply unacceptable. <laughs> so it's the mentality that they've taken on that I've seen with other groups, and not just in the rights of nature realm, but looking at broader community rights, whether it be civil, economical, otherwise, uh, that there's this need to keep pushing forward, that doing so, in essence, means giving up, and that there's this degree of disobedience that has to form if you have systems of law that are, are operating illegitimately. And again, every movement has had to put that same question forward that just because a law doesn't make it just. Mm -hmm. And so it's about people questioning the unjust laws and beginning to figure out how to change that. And in the rights of nature movement, I think that's what you're seeing in the United States. Uh, we started to see that in other parts of the world, that people are starting to call out systems of law that they find to be unjust to the environment itself, so in essence being unjust to people, and are looking to blaze a new path to begin to change that. So. That's all I had for my end of presenting. And like I said, the other part we wanted to do, if people have energy for it, is just talk about what would rights of nature potentially mean in this area.